So we got to talk about cinnabar, uh, and we got to talk about mercury a little bit. Um, so first of all, here's a sample of the red rock. This is what the native people had long been using for hundreds of years. Um, they used it in a very different manner. They didn't see it as valuable for what it contained in it. They saw it as valuable because it was a very it was seen as a powerful color when they pounded it into a fine powder in their bedrock mortars. They could crush this rock, pulverize it into this powder, mix it with animal fat into a paint, and they could paint their bodies and other things for ceremonial purpose. Red was a very powerful color to them. It was not something always easily acquired in nature, which is where they obtained all of their materials. And so it was also sought after by other Native American tribes, so they could also use it as their trade system, as their money. Um, so the Native people were the first to use cinnabar. Um, it wasn't until outsiders came in and settled the area and, and saw its use for a, a very different reason. So I'm going to pass it around, but I want to warn you that it is heavy, so be ready for it. Is it half mercury? Uh, there is mercury inside of it, and people always go, ah! Um, the mercury that's contained inside that rock is, is trapped within the bonds of that rock and could not harm anybody just by handling it on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will notice when you pick the rock up, it is a very heavy and dense rock. And so we'll talk a little bit about mercury. I'm probably preaching to the choir because you guys are all engineers, right? So you all know uh, mercury and Soft what it's about. Software engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Virtual! Virtual! Ex-chemist. <laughs> so, anybody know the uh, periodic chart number for Mercury? 79? Yeah, I know it's in the 70s. I don't, I, I don't even know, so I'm going to believe you. Yeah. We will oh. Google that and find out. We can Google that. <laughs> so, Mercury is a metal. It's the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. It's very heavy and very dense. If I were to compare mercury to water, mercury is about 13 and a half times the weight of water. For example, if I had a can of soda, I emptied that out and I filled it up with mercury, that can would weigh about 10 pounds. Very heavy, very dense. And I think it can't be any better depicted than from this photograph. This was a photo that came out in a National Geographic article in the 1970s that talked about mercury poisoning. And somehow they got this guy to pose for this photo. So what you see is what looks like a guy sitting on top of a piece of tin foil or water or something. In fact, he is sitting in a large pool repository of liquid mercury. So here's the thing. Remember we talked mercury is very heavy. It's much heavier and more dense than water. Humans are made mostly of water. So here we have a full-grown human male sitting on the top of this liquid, and yet he does not have enough body mass to displace that mercury beneath him. So that really gives you a good sense of the properties of mercury and why it is so unique and, and special. Can he just touch mercury bare hands? Yeah, is that a good idea? <laughs> no. Um, so we also have to talk about, and I can take the rock back if you're ready. Um, we can also talk about the darker side of mercury. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of value in mercury. And one of the most values that they found was that this liquid silver stuff was really unique in that it will adhere to gold and it will adhere to silver. So I'm going to call your attention to a display right over here where we show the process called amalgamation. Amalgamation was the name of the game. That's why this mercury was so sought after. That's where most of this mercury was being utilized. Keep in mind the California Gold Rush. When they, were first, when they first discovered gold in 1848 in California, this was gold that they found in the creeks and rivers, large chunks a gold nugget called placer gold. That's free gold and you can put that in your pocket and, and take it to the bank. As more and more people progressed and came to California and we were looking for more gold and all that free gold was drying up, we were now going further up into the root of the mountains to find where that gold was coming from. 
and we were digging those rocks out of the mountain to be able to get at the gold trapped inside. So if I show you a piece of rock up on the back ledge here, if you can see it, there's a piece of granite there. And if you see intermixed among the molecules of granite are little bits of gold. But that doesn't do me any good unless I can separate the gold. And that's where mercury came in. This process called amalgamation, this would have been a process we would have found up in the Sierra Mountains here in California where they were um, processing gold ore. And it would start with this device called a stamp mill. And I have a small scale model here that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. It's very tired. Anyway, you get the idea. It's loud. <laughs> so there would be a very large contraption up in the Sierras where the stamp mill would be crushing that rock containing the gold. And it would crush it into as small a particles as possible like the consistency of grains of sand. Those particles would be introduced to an amalgamation table you can see the photograph of the men working here at this, this table. You can see the big steel pounding teeth right behind where they're standing. And the table in front of them has uh, a layer of liquid mercury on the bottom. That mercury, as the rocks are coming in, the little sand particles are coming in to that table, the mercury is adhering to the particles of gold. Remember how heavy and dense mercury is. If, if uh, a piece of uh, feldspar or mica or quartz were intermixed in there, it would just float to the top. That could be scraped off and that would become waste material. The mercury itself would be locked to all the particles of gold. And that's what these men would do is they would scoot together the big amorphous blob of, of silver goo called amalgam. Now I've got my gold and it's all there trapped in my mercury, but how do I separate that? Well, the beauty of mercury is it takes a fairly low temperature, relatively, to turn mercury into a vapor or a gas. And that is useful in when they process um, the, the rock to get the mercury out. But in this process, where I've got my amalgam, I need to separate it. And to do that, I would put it in a retort, which is a pressure cooker or a pot, I would heat it to about 1,000 degrees, and that mercury would turn into a gas or a vapor. I would capture that gas or that vapor in a long condensing pipe. This would be much longer. It would be cooled along its route, and it would turn back into liquid form, where they could collect it back into their flask and use it over and over again. So when I take the lid off my retort, what do I have inside of pure gold? And that process had been known for a couple thousand years. Um, it had been used all over the world, but at, at no point did we have any source here in North America prior to 1845, which, was, which is what makes this discovery so special and so unique. Um, the amalgamation process was extremely effective. Um, it was uh, cost effective. Um, it was fairly efficient. However, around 1900, they discovered a new process to amalgamate gold and silver, and they call that the cyanide process. They still use the cyanide process today, but essentially the market converted overnight from mercury to cyanide. And so this company, because it was such a large uh, production company, uh, they were not able to withstand the fluctuations in the market. I'm sure they didn't make some great business decisions at the time, and they ended up going bankrupt and folding. So they sold off the house, the town, the workings, and all of the above in order to you know, uh, get whatever out of it they, that they could. From then on, the workings continued to be mined, but uh, not to the same scale. And again, that went all the way from 1976. There is no other use of a mercury? There's lots of other uses. So that's probably the majority of, of what this mercury was being used. For. But mercury is used for a lot of different reasons in medicine, in dentistry, in manufacturing, um, in lots of different things. We still use it today, it's just not as plentiful. So here we talk a little bit about the dark side of mercury. Um, mercury actually for uh, a long time was thought to be a very healing thing. 
Um, if you look in uh, the room next door, we have a, a doctor's case that has a lot of medicine bottles that were typically used uh, during the 1800s. And if you read the labels on the medicine bottles, a lot of them have mercury as the primary ingredient. Um, starting in you know, Asia and Europe, uh, mercury was felt to have a lot of healing properties, um, including uh, cures for depression, for syphilis, for gastric ailments, all kinds of things. Um, and, and I believe that to be partially true, but I think a lot of it was probably the placebo effect. <laughs> Uh, mercury in its elemental form, the silver liquid, is actually about 0% soluble by water. So I don't understand how a human body is going to be able to absorb that into tissue. The problem comes in, uh, through uh, the gaseous state of mercury. So when you heat it and turn it into its gaseous form, now your body it can readily absorb that into your bloodstream and it is a neurotoxin and it will start to impact your brain function very quickly. Um, anybody familiar with Alice in Wonderland? Few, few head shaking. So we have a really popular children's book called Alice in Wonderland. And one of the characters in the book is called the Mad Hatter. That saying, mad as a hatter, actually came into being during uh, the 18th century, 18th, 19th century, when English hatters were making felt hats. They used mercury, but they would heat it into a vapor, and that vapor would sort of permeate the fabric of the hats that they were making mm -hmm. uh, to give it stability and structure, and they were breathing those fumes in in small workshops over long periods of time, and they would begin to salivate and have an unsteady gait, and, and it eventually go crazy, and it became known as the Mad Hatter's disease, or you were mad as a some of us have gold fillings that are amalgamated, gold amalgamated with mercury. So dentistry is another big source of where mercury goes. And then of course manufacturing. We sold um, uh, over-the-counter thermometers that included mercury in them up until the 1980s when it started becoming more heightened awareness, uh, where, where we started to take it out of the supply chain. Um, and so you can, you can still, it's still bought and sold in the market, but it's just not as readily available to the public because the fear is that it's going to be misused. Uh, it's not going to harm you by touching it or it. technically it's not going to really harm you. Um, the fear is the other dark side of the market. And that is when it is introduced into the environment at a you know, larger scale than, than what is naturally occurring, when you get that, that elemental liquid mercury into, say, the water chain, especially in still bodies of water. Uh, around here, there was a big effort to build a lot of lakes and reservoirs and dams to be able to provide water to the farming and, and the urban development here. And just up the, up the road here, we've got Almaden Reservoir, and right over the top, we've got Guadalupe Reservoir, and up that way, we've got Calero Reservoir. The problem is, is, in this place where we did all this mining for 150 years, there's bound to be mercury introduced into that environment. When the mercury, and it's very heavy, so when it uh, settles out at the bottom of that still body of water and settles into the mud and the muck at the bottom, that becomes a very anaerobic environment in which uh, chem uh, bacterial and chemical conversion of that elemental form of mercury will convert it into methyl mercury. Methyl mercury is a different chemical composition, one which is extremely toxic. Individual. And so you will find if you see any of the lakes and reservoirs associated nearby Almaden and Ramadan, um, you'll see signs everywhere that say do not consume any fish um, obtained from these waters. And that's because the likelihood of that fish tissue containing methyl mercury, the highly toxic form, um, is, is definitely increased. Um, How about the, how the fruits, fruits nearby? Not so much because that is a surface. Uh, it, this is more of like down at the subsurface layers and um, really the, it, it gets into the plants and the algae and then the fish eat the plants and the algae. Um, but it's not like free like floating in the water sort of thing. It has to be contained in the flesh of something. Um, and so 
it's a very real concern and one which uh, we've tried to address. We, meaning county parks and all the different regulatory agencies, have tried to decrease the amount of mercury going in. Um, so we did a huge cleanup effort in the 1970s and 1980s to try and get rid of a lot of that mercury. Um, and then the water district has tried to use uh, various devices to try to keep the bottom of these lakes oxygenated. Um, all uh, designed to try and counteract that, that chemical conversion process. <coughs> so all told, New Almaden, uh, the Quicksilver Mine, um, is known as the first mine in Northern California, the deepest mine in Northern California, and the richest mine in all of Northern California. Um, though in the history books, you'll be rebuilt. So, uh, uh, gold mine, uh, how did the other material, was that just the record? The cyanide? The cyanide? Yeah. Uh, it's a dissolution process, and uh, apparently it was uh, even more uh, efficient, cost effective, um, easier to acquire, easier to obtain. It, basically, it comes down to dollars uh, and what you can get. as deep as 600 feet below sea level. Mm -hmm. So 2,200 feet below the surface. So they also had to employ big pumps to keep the water, the water table, out of the areas that they were mining. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at some of the photos, you'll see um, working conditions were not ideal. Uh, you know, they began underground work with candles and pickaxes. Um, they uh, use these big hoist systems to play out cable for cages that would carry men and equipment up and down these shafts that went hundreds of feet below uh, the ground level. Um, ultimately seeking this cinnabar ore that they would follow uh, in, in veins. So they would have to follow the vein of cinnabar as it you know, moves through the earth um, and it wasn't an exact science. A lot of people ask me about, well, did a lot of miners die from mercury poisoning? And to that I say, I'm sure there were probably health impacts to a lot of them, but I would imagine that to be the least of their problems. <laughs> uh, life expectancy was not so great back then. Uh, you were working with explosives, you were working before work site regulations, uh, uh, pride and safety above all else. Uh, falls, um, collapses, cave-ins. Um, I think the exposure to mercury was definitely a real concern, um, but over their lifetime, it was not what killed them. Certainly it caused an impact, but it's not ultimately what killed them. So. so I can let you guys, for the next a little bit, if you guys want to wander around and look at what the mining museum has to offer, use the restroom, take a drink, um, and then I'll just stay here if you guys have any other questions. Wonderful. Fun.